Sometimes it's really helpful to remember your foundation. The place where you feel connected to your core, you know you're standing on solid ground, and no winds or anything else is going to blow you off course. It's especially important when new or unusual situations hit you. It could be something that's scary, or it could be almost anything, like discovering something about your heritage that you didn't know, or dealing with your sexuality and facing something you weren't sure about. Or it could be realizing you have a vocation that isn't going to make you a lot of money. But that foundation is important then, but also I wondered, why is that foundation so important in the future? The event for me that helped me sort of find my foundational truth, so to speak, was when I was asked to lead a choir retreat at a church in Hartford, Connecticut. I was just ordained an Episcopal priest. I was sort of a new kid on the block. I had ideas. I wanted to shake things up. And I'd heard about the four Quaker questions. And I thought, what a great exercise for this choir. They needed to get to know each other, and they could go as deep or as shallow as they wanted to, talking with one another. Where did you grow up? How was your house heated? What was the center of warmth in your home, and when did you first know God loved you? And the choir did great. There were about 12 people. They shared information. They talked about their experiences. There was a deep sharing, especially for that last question. I heard people talk about, my grandparents were the ones who told me that God loved me and didn't judge me. Or a time when a spouse was ill, or a family member died, that they had some awareness that there was more going on there than just their friends or their family, that there was something more present, something spiritual, that was walking that journey with them. Now, I had answers to those questions, too. Where did I grow up? Rural New Jersey. What was the, uh, how was my house heated? Forced hot air, I remember this big vent right in the dining, uh, in our dining room, and you could stand out it to stay warm. The center of warmth in our home, the kitchen and a butcher block table. And when did you first know God loved you? Oops. You know, when you lead these retreats, you should figure out your answers before you lead the retreat. But I hadn't figured it out. And the answer that jumped into my mind was embarrassing because it was an event that happened during my second year of being in graduate school in seminary. Now, you think if you're going to go to seminary, you would have figured out the God stuff first. But you know, there's the head stuff, and then there's the heart stuff. I could talk about God and theology and scripture and saving the world and making the world a better place, but being loved... So the story I ended up telling <clears throat> was about my second year in seminary. I was in New York City, and as it happened, both my parents were having open-heart surgery. Their surgeon was at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. I was at seminary in Lower Manhattan. So every day, I would go to school, then I'd get on the subway, I'd go 144 streets, see my parents, get back on the subway, come back, do my homework. Talk about being stressed. And one night, I got back to school, and I was just pissed and exhausted. And I went out on 10th Avenue, and I took a walk, and I just railed at God. What do you want from me? What more am I supposed to do? What's going, what, what do you want me to do? So let me be clear. No voice, no sign on a billboard, but there was some sense of inner clarity and a message came through that was sort of like, Thad, I don't want you to do anything. I'm your creator. I love you. You can't do anything. I'm already with you on these trips up and down Manhattan. So I don't know. Maybe it was stress. Maybe it was exhaustion. But I decided to listen and even believe that message. Little did I know that it would shortly be the step, the foundation from which I would come out to myself. You see, for 27 years, 
I basically ignored the whole issue of my sexuality. Now, in 2020, that might seem almost impossible. And with therapy and a lot of work and time, I can look back and realize the roots of that. But friends, in 1979, I was clueless. I had no idea. So some friends and I, oh, I was also uh, in 1979, I was working in Philadelphia. I took a year off from graduate school to earn money to pay for my last year. And so some friends of mine and I decided, uh, actually over this President's Day weekend, we went winter camping up in New Hampshire, the White Mountains. And during that time, I realized that my best friend, something was off. And I said to him at one point, I, I don't know what's going on. I know you're having a hard time, but just know that I care about you. And if I can help you in any way, just let me know. I'd be glad to talk. And much to my surprise, he actually called me up and he said, I want to get on the train, come to Philadelphia, we'll have dinner, we'll talk, i got to get on the train the next morning and go back for school. I said, okay, that would be great. And I had no idea what was coming. So he came down, we had dinner, and then we sat down to talk. And he told me that the previous fall, he had had a gay experience. Even though he thought of himself as a straight man, he had a fiancé, but he found this whole side of himself that he was both amazing and sort of confusing. And he was just trying to figure out what was going on. He also said to me that he was a little afraid to tell me about this story. Because he perceived me as something as a jock, and he wasn't sure how I was going to respond. And as it was, I was actually the executive director for the sport of rowing in the United States at the time. But my response was totally supportive. How can I help? I'm with you all the way. Well, to make a long and somewhat complicated story uh, shorter, that night I had my first sexual same-sex experience with my best friend. And it was wonderful. But then the next morning, I was scared. I said to him, ah, I'm not sure this should ever happen again. And he had to get on the train to go to school, and I had to go to work. So I go to my car, and it won't start. Coincidence? I, I don't know, but it meant I had to walk to work. And on the walk, I went past the Museum of Modern Art, into Fairmont Park, along the Schuylkill River, and everything looked different. The grass was greener, the trees were greener, the sky was bluer. Everything was different and in a good way. I got to work and decided this is useless, so I turned around and walked back home and sat down to write my best friend a letter. I told him that what I realized is that for years, I had hidden my sexuality behind a great big brick wall. I had just tucked it away and tried to ignore it as much as I could. But that this experience with him had put a crack in that wall and light was streaming through. There was a disfraction. The light touched all parts of my being and I realized I had a choice. I could either decide to plaster up the crack and stay in darkness or I could start to dismantle the wall. And that's when I remembered my foundation, that, that I wasn't alone on this journey. So I continued to write, and I said to him, the reason I said I don't think this should happen again is because I was afraid. And that instead, my care for him, maybe even my love for him, had somehow allowed me to touch my sexuality. And even more scary, to touch it as a gay man. And I wondered if he would be willing to talk. Again, long story short, lots of complications, but we were in a committed relationship for three years. And I was on that journey of saying yes to being a gay man and figuring out ways to be open and out on that journey. 
But at some point, I wondered, what did I do with all those bricks? What does one do with all the mental, psychic, emotional, all that energy that I used so much to hide from my sexuality, when you start dismantling it, what do you do with it? And in looking back, what I realize is I used old bricks to build bridges. When I left Philadelphia and I went back to school for my final year, where the first two years in New York City had taken this rural kid and just freaked me out, all of a sudden Manhattan was kind of exciting. I had an opportunity for my field placement to work with shopping bag ladies, homeless women who lived on the street. I went and interviewed with a group of Roman Catholic nuns who had a ministry to these women, and I said to Sister Bernanette, ah, I'm not sure why I'm here. What, what does a guy who went to a prep school and an Ivy League college have to offer a shopping bag lady? And I will never forget, Bernadette looked me straight in the eye and said to me, your presence. And suddenly, a bridge started to be built. That year, twice a week, from 11 p.m. to 1 in the morning, I would go to the bus station at the Port Authority or the train station at Penn Station, and I would seek out shopping bag ladies, and I would sit down and offer to talk with them, and if they didn't want to talk with me, which is more often the case, I would just sit quietly for 10 or 15 minutes, say goodnight, and then move on. Two mornings a week, I would go to the dwelling place at their ministry and help serve breakfast to any homeless woman who walked in. I was stunned at the energy and the care that was given to these women and thought, I, I want my first job to be in a city. So when I got a chance to work, I moved to Hartford, Connecticut, my first church. Small church, racially diverse, not, not a lot of people, not fancy. Indeed, there was 240 units of low-income housing right in our backyard, and that church had built an extra 112 units of low-income housing on their property. It was exciting, and I was, I was jazzed. It was going to be a great challenge. And then the AIDS crisis came to Hartford. And I'll tell you, friends, I almost started putting those bricks back up. This is the early, mid-'80s. There was no treatment there was uh, no cure. It was basically a death sentence. And everybody said it was the gay disease. Well, one day, a woman from the neighborhood came to the church and asked if I would go visit her husband who was dying with AIDS. So at the time, I said that I would, and then I'm not proud of this, but I put it off, and I put it off, but I finally did go. And I went to her apartment, and I knocked on the door, and she invited me in, and we chatted, and she handed me a glass of water. Now, I know you can't get AIDS from a glass of water, but that's rational. The irrational fear just hit me, and I had to make a decision. And I decided, again, that I wasn't alone in this journey, and I took that glass of water, and I drank it because I'd begun to realize that the thing that was happening with HIV and AIDS was three things that are scary for human beings were all connected. The whole issue of sex and sexuality, the whole issue of drugs and addiction, and then, oh, let's connect it all to death. People did not want to talk about this, but I actually realized that maybe religion or spirituality or whatever it was had language and words that could help people move from fear to compassion. Where some people were saying this is God's wrath and people are getting what, they're, what they deserve, in our little church we decided we were going to say this is an illness and we're going to respond with care, compassion, and respect. We were the first church to have a healing service for people with AIDS. And I began slowly to start working locally and nationally to see if we could find ways to build bridges to help get from fear to compassion. 
So I founded an organization in the city where I was, and we were very fortunate that there was an ad advertising agency that worked in that city. And they put together four posters for uh, AIDS Awareness Month, and you'll see them on the screen. Building bridges to help people say, oh, maybe there's another way to respond to HIV AIDS. At the same time, one of the things we realized is people were losing their housing because of fear around HIV and AIDS and discriminating against people, kicking them out of their apartments. And this wasn't just happening in Hartford. This was happening in lots of cities. And so pretty soon, we decided there was a way to build a coalition. Instead of everybody figuring it out in eight different cities, let's all come together and figure out how best to respond to this reality. And the Connecticut AIDS Residents Coalition actually uh, ended up going to our legislature and getting a million dollars in bond money so that we could provide housing for people living with HIV and AIDS. In the same way, the National Episcopal Church was trying to figure out ways to respond with care and compassion. And it also occurred to me that if we're not careful, we're going to reinvent the wheel again. So this is our button up on the slide with our, with our theme, Our Church Has AIDS, trying to make sure that we were going to work together to help people living with HIV and AIDS. And then, what about young people? You know, one of the highest risk groups in the 80s were young people, mostly teenagers. So it's one thing to have a bunch of grown-ups say to teenagers, well, you know, this is what you ought to do, and, you know, this is how you ought to be, and safe sex, and all that. What I realized was, if you want to build a bridge to a young person, you educate their peers to be peer educators. And so I helped write a curriculum that would help young people learn all about HIV and AIDS so they could help their peers make sure they didn't get HIV infected. So, looking back, I realized I spent most of my professional life trying to take old bricks to build new bridges. Helping individuals and people find that foundational place that was solid for them so that they could do something to help others. For me, it was that I was loved by my creator. But whatever it was for someone else, find that foundation and then realize it's not there just to keep you happy. It's there to be an anchor to build a bridge so you can reach out and help other people. And remember, you can't do it by yourself. My best friend had to come, overcome his fear, and come and talk to me so I could face my own fears and be more true about who I was. So whatever it is for you, if you find your foundation, I just hope that you will discover that the world looks different. The grass is greener, the sky is bluer. It's different, and it's a good thing. Find your foundation. Build a bridge. Help others. Because, my friends, we live in a desperate time, and the need is great. May we all do that. Thank you.